we're glad you're here. It's a great week, great weather. God's good. He's here for you today. More importantly, you're here because he has something special he wants to say in your life. I believe it. I believe it because I know that scripture says where two or three are gathered in my name, there he is also. He is here for you today. No matter what your week's been like, no matter what your morning's been like, no matter what that drive to church was like, God is still in control and God is still here. And he's going to be with you no matter what you face. This morning as we kind of prepare our hearts today, today is a day of miracles. We live in a day and age where our God is alive. And because he's alive, he can do the impossible. No matter what you're facing, no matter the heartbreak, no matter the obstacles, no matter the challenges, our God is a God of miracles. Today, whatever you're facing, whether it be relational challenges or maybe it's a, a marriage situation, or maybe it's financial, maybe today you are just got a doctor's report in and it says things aren't good. No matter what, I'm here to tell you, serve a God of miracles. He's here for you today. He knows your heartache. He knows your pain. And all he asks you to do is come believe. Believe he's the God of miracles and he will meet you where you're at. Listen as this song speaks about our great God, our God of miracles. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Sing it again. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The one who does impossible.
God of miracles. Just God of miracles. Give hands to the one who can do the impossible. The God who was and is to come. Oh, oh. The power of the risen one. say this, say, I need a miracle from you, God. I need a miracle. I don't know which way to turn. I, I've tried to figure it out. I've tried to analyze. I've tried to make something happen, but God, ultimately, I surrender, and I need you. Keep your hands raised for just a second. Father, for every hand that is raised, I pray that, God, you would prove yourself to them, that you would be the God of you would speak peace into lives of turmoil, that you would speak hope 
in the hopelessness, that you would speak joy into a place where sadness dwells, that God, right now, you would, you would speak healing, God, in the physical body, that, Lord, those that are sick would feel healing right now. Those marriages that are, that are broken, you would restore and you'd renew, that, that God, you'd begin to do something incredible because you are the God, the God of miracles. So we call on you. We trust you, God, because you are the God of miracles. Say it, I believe. things press in, it doesn't mean that you've abandoned us, but it means to press on with you. I pray that God, the word would come alive today, that it would speak into hearts, but most importantly, that God, you would transform and you would change our hearts so that God, we could be truly, fully devoted followers of you. Thank you for this time that we've had to worship. Thank you for your presence that is already here. May continue to move upon lives, we ask you right now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. It's our summer sermon series, S3, called Faith Works, and we have been on a lot of stuff. We have gone through the book of James, uh, where we've been looking at the how-tos of Christian faith. Now, remember, when I started way back in June, I know some of you thought we'd never get to this book, but we did, through persistence, through dedication, uh, through, through, through just the will of God, we were able to get through it. And remember the first Sunday I started talking, I said, why we're going to do this? Here's why. Because as Christ followers, we have to understand how to live out our life in Christ. And you remember I told you that James, the book of James, is written to a group of Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians were people who believed in Judaism but had converted to Christianity. And when they converted, they tried to figure out, how do I live this thing? This is so, it's not that it was so different, it was just freeing. Because, see, Judaism was a set of rules and regulations. It was religion. It was, this is what you are not supposed to do. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't eat that. It was a list of what you don't do. And Jesus came to say, listen, it's all open to you. Because you're not saved through what you do. You're saved by grace. Isn't that amazing, the difference? I mean, how many of you guys know that there's lots of religions out there that, that have a set of lists, this, 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 and then you're good. Uh, many religions import and, and, and actually uh, take on and adapt an attitude where, well, if you do certain things, then God will love you. But if you break it, you better have some penance and get back to God. 
You better do so many things in order to get back to God. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. He who comes to me uh, is, is, uh, is going to heaven. He's the only way to God. It was Jesus who said, listen, those things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees tell you to do, nope, doesn't work, doesn't save you. The only thing that saves you is through the power of Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes on the scene and he rocks the world. Uh, the Ten Commandments Moses gave when he went out to Mount Sinai and he came down, he said, here's Ten Commandments that you're supposed to follow. But man looked at those Ten Commandments, you know what they said? They said, wait a minute, it can't be that easy. It can't be that easy to follow just 10. There has to be more explanation because why? Here's what, here's what the religious people thought. They thought, you're too stupid to really understand what God meant. So let's help you out, understand what God meant. He said, let's keep the Sabbath holy. Here's what he means. You can only walk so many feet per day on the Sabbath. You can only eat certain things on the Sabbath. You can only go to certain places on the Sabbath. So man took 10 commandments and through the religious rules of the day, created 3,000 rules. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time following three rules, much less 3,000, right? You're right? I mean, 3,000 rules, and, and, and they wanted you to follow to the letter of the law, what it says you're supposed to do. But Jesus came and wrecked all that, and he, he, he shook that up, and he challenged that. He took everything that they had and he summed it up in two. What's the two greatest commandments? He said, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, because all these are summed up in everything else out there. If we would love God, we, wouldn't, we would keep the Sabbath holy. If we would love God, we would not put others before us. We wouldn't commit idolatry. If we loved God, we would not do these things. If we loved our neighbor self, we would not offend them. We would not steal. We would not cheat. We would not do those things. Why? Because... Jesus said, it's very simple, love God, love each other. So James comes along and he's, he's looking at this Jewish Christian church. Now I'm giving you a lot of history, but just I want to summarize today. He's looking at this Jewish Christian church and he's finding that, that they have bought into the grace, but they totally abandoned the works. They became very lazy in their approach of how to serve and walk out with God. So James comes in and says, wait, 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 there's a balance to it all. You once were very religious, now you're completely free, but there has to be a balance in the middle. So he says, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to tell you how you live your life. I'm going to tell you how you walk out with Christ. I'm going to tell you the how-tos. Remember, James is the most practical book in the New Testament. It's the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. James is the book of wisdom in the New Testament. James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, and he talks about three themes, three themes that he gives us every single week. I've said it for 14 weeks. 14 weeks I've said this theme. If you're new, you get a pass. Everybody else? I talked about three things that James continually said week after week after week. He challenged us to live a consistent life and a persistent life and to have no fear. Persistent, consistent, and have no fear. Thank you, guys. Those in first service, you really helped me out. Good. <laughs> he challenged us to live consistent, persistent, with no fear. And I talked about being marked. What does a mature person look like? How do we stay positive under uh, uh, problems when they come our way? How to be wise with our wealth? How to treat people right? How to avoid arguments? How to manage your mouth? How to, how to trust God for the future? How to, how to live by faith? I mean, I can't go over all of them, but guys, you missed them. Go to YouTube. Go to uh, Google Play. Go to, the, uh, go to the podcast. They're all out there challenging us about our faith because faith will work. So today, as I wrap it all up, I had to look at how James wrapped it all up. I had to look at how does he summarize these five, these five chapters that, that speak about our lives. How does he summarize it? And here's what, I, here's what I learned. James is going to say in the next few verses, 13 through 20, he's going to say this. He's going to say, listen, you can try to manage your mouth, but it'll never happen without this thing today. You can try to treat people right, but it'll never happen without what you're going to hear today. You can try to be wise with your money, but you're never going to be able to do it without what you're going to hear today. So today is kind of a summary, bringing everything together. Today, you picked the best day to be at church today. Welcome, 
back. <laughs> or welcome for the first time. Because today, everything I've said will come to a head today because today is a summary saying, this is how you walk it out. And here's what he says. It's very simple, but very hard. He says, you must use prayer. Prayer is the key to all the answers that you're looking for. Prayer is essential to move from this place to the next. Without prayer, without communing, talking to God, without a relationship with God, everything you do, everything you've done is null and void. It's moot point. Prayer is the center of what you have to have in your walk with God. Five, seven times he speaks about prayer in the next few verses we're going to read. The challenge is this. How do we pray? What do we pray for? The challenge is, the challenge is when we walk with God, how do we talk with God? Well, let's read it today. We're going to get in our Bibles today. If you would, open them up. James chapter 5, stand to your feet, verse uh, verse 13 through 20. Let's do our Bible prayer with your Bibles in hands or your iPads, your tablets, your cell phones, whatever you have. Hold the word of God in your hand. Let's do the Bible prayer. It says this. It says, I hold the hope of the world, the blueprint for life. I will read it, study it, and share it. God, help me to understand it, apply it, and live it in Jesus' name. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse 13. It says this. It says, is any one of you in trouble? He should what? He should pray. pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call on the others and uh, elders of the church, and they are to what? They are to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. He says, because, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person what? It'll make them what? The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Verse 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray. say it again. And pray. for each other's uh, for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer. Of, of the righteous man is powerful and effective. It says Elijah was a man just like us. And he what? Pray. Say it again. He Say a little enthusiasm. Come on, people. Earnestly, uh, that it would not rain. And it did not rain in the land for three and a half years through the power of prayer. It says, again, then he prayed. And the heavens gave rain. And the earth produced its crops. Verse 19, my brothers, if any one of you should wonder from the truth and someone should bring him back, it says, remember this, whoever returns a sinner in the error of his ways will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. So God, help us today. Let your word speak life. Let us learn that God, through the power of prayer, things happen, that you can change lives, you can change futures, you can change destinies, God. I pray that, Lord, you'll speak your word of life to us today in your name. Amen. Amen. How to pray with power. How do we pray effective prayers? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is this. There is no formula that I can give you about how to pray. All I can tell you is that God wants you to pray. And when I talk about prayer, I'm not talking about the liturgical, you know, oh, this is, you know, talking all elegant. I mean, just being yourself and just talking to God. God is, what I love about my relationship with God is it's like my relationship with my son. I don't talk differently with my son or I don't talk differently with my daughter whenever I have a relationship with them. You know why? Because they know me. They know who I am. I know them. And whenever I talk, I have a relationship with them. That's what prayer is really supposed to be. But we in, our, we in our minds believe that we have to be something of a higher education to talk with God. And yet God doesn't ever ask that. In fact, he never asked that. What did Jesus say? He said, when you pray, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us day our daily bread and forgive those who trespass against us. This is the power of prayer. Very simple. You know, you read the Lord's Prayer and you're going, I can do that. I can do that every day. Do you realize that, that there's such simplicity 
in the power of prayer. But so many times we get distracted with prayer. So many times we, we think we're not worthy to pray. Hello? So many times we think we can't go to God. I'm in the middle of something right now. I can't go to God because if I go to God, he'll see what mess I am. He's already discovered how messy you are. He's already figured out you have made a mess. You're not fooling him. You're not going to fix it until you go to him in prayer. So when should we go to God in prayer? Number one, first, re first, time, first reason why I see that we need to go, according to James, to God in prayer. When I'm hurting emotionally. Turn to your neighbor and say emotionally. When I'm hurting emotionally, James chapter 13 says, if anyone is in trouble, he should pray. When I'm hurting emotionally, we should pray. Pray. That, that, that word trouble actually translates to suffer misfortune. It's, it, it means to be under stress. It means to be in distress. It's, it's a heartache thing. You Maybe today you're going through a relational heartache, or maybe you're going through a financial heartache, or maybe you're going through a job situation, or maybe it's with your kids, or maybe it's with your spouse. I don't know what it is, but here's what I know. If you are hurting emotionally, it's time to pray. It's time to ask God to help you out. I get emotionally hurt when I go to Subway and there's no fresh chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Devastates me. Let's go to prayer right away. Psalm 18 verse 4 says it this way. Psalm 18 verse 4 says, In my distress, I call to the Lord. When I'm in trouble, when I'm in distress, when I'm hurting, I pray. What's interesting is you have verse 12 and you have verse 13. And in verse 12, last week we talked about it. He says, do not swear. James says, do not swear. Let your yes be yes and your no's be no's. Do not swear. And then in verse 13, it says, if you're in trouble, pray. So it's interesting that there's these contrasting verses right together. Do not swear, but if you're in trouble, pray. So it, it, you know how many... It's not about when we get in trouble, oftentimes we swear. Oftentimes we get mad, we get upset. We're like in verse 13, we, we, we let it fly because we think that's going to make us feel better. But there's two kinds of philosophies, two kinds of added approaches to problems. You're either going to swear or you're going to pray. You're either going to swear or you're going to pray. You're going to give it over to God. I'm here to tell you, I have never fixed a problem through swearing. But I have seen God move through the power of prayer. So which one are you going to be? A swearer or a prayer? How are you going to approach it? As a pastor, I get challenged with many things that come my way. I've had to learn how to be uh, quick to adjust, quick to alter, quick to uh, make decisions on a fly because it's just the nature of the, the office that I hold. But I had to learn it. It wasn't something that came natural. And here's what I learned in the process of getting there. I've learned to pray a lot, all the time. I have people come up to me all the time and they'll, they'll, they'll get into, you know, whatever their life is holding, and I don't want to belittle it, but it's, you know, it's their life, and they got a lot of stuff going on, and I've had to learn how to do some shotgun prayers. You know what that is? It's like, <laughs> God help me. I don't know what to say. That's kind of what I say. I look at them like deer in the head like, uh-huh, and then inside I'm going, Jesus, Jesus, come on now. Take the wheel, because I don't know what to say at times. I, I don't know how to, how to speak into people's lives, but, but here's what I know. I know that through the power of prayer that they will hear what God wants them to hear. So maybe today you're facing an emotional challenge. Maybe you're hurting emotionally. Maybe you're facing some darkness, maybe some sadness, maybe some madness, uh, maybe depression. Maybe there's something that just really is pressing in on there. I'm here to tell you, pray. Because this says, if you are in trouble, he is to pray. Second thing, second uh, reason why we should pray or when we should pray is when I'm hurting physically, when I'm hurting physically. Uh, it goes and says in verse 14 and 15, it says, is any one of you sick? He should call on the elders of the church and pray over him and anoint him with oil and the, and the, in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will raise them up, will make them well, and the Lord will raise him up. 
And then he, his sin will be forgiven. What's powerful about this passage is it's talking about this word sick. This word sick is more than just acid reflux. Okay? It's more than, more than just a little, uh, you know, I hurt my knee, you know, playing a game or something. It, it's more than, God cares about all that, but this word in this passage is actually more than. It's, it's something more intense that you're facing. It's more than a, a little paper cut or a little bruise, a new little owie, you know. This is actually talking about, it's talking about terminal. It's talking about deep sickness. It's talking about things like cancer, leukemia. It's talking about uh, paraly paralyzation. It's talking about things that he's saying, listen, if you're sick, we're going to pray. And we're going to believe God to do a miracle as only God can do. It's more than just the simple things. It's about an intense sickness that God can heal through the power of prayer. There's three kinds of sickness that's talked about in the Bible. First one is sickness for death. Sickness for death is that you get sick and it's because God is allowing that to come in your life in order to move you from this place to his place uh, with a far better real estate and far better mortgage and far better housing than what we have here, okay? Sickness for death. Then there's sickness uh, for discipline. Sickness for discipline is uh, maybe God is trying to get your attention. Or maybe God is trying to help you see something. Or maybe you're just making stupid decisions by eating a lot of Subway chocolate chip cookies, and God's saying, listen, lay off of those, you know, whatever it is, sickness for discipline to try to get our attention to get us back to a different place. And the last one is sickness for the glory of God. The sickness for the glory of God. Now, we see this in Scripture. We see that that God allowed sickness to come to people's lives all to the glory of God. Remember Job? I talked about him, I think, last week or maybe two weeks ago. I told you Job lost everything in 48 hours. He lost his wife. Or he lost his house, lost his kids, lost his livestock, lost everything except for his incredible, awesome, supportive wife who nagged him every day to curse God and die. <laughs> what a great lady. And, and, uh, and so here's, here's Job, and Job is sick on his deathbed, but he didn't curse God. Instead, God raised him up to the glory of God, and the last half of Job's life was more blessed than his first. Why? Because it was sickness for the glory of God. There's so many times that we don't understand why sickness comes our way, and, and yet God so many times has a plan. So many different philosophies of healing that are out there. There's sensationalists. This is in your notes. I'm just going to kind of define it real quick. Sensationalists. It means that the TV evangelists send me your $1,000 and you send you a prayer cloth and you'll be healed. I mean, they make everything very dramatic, and it's a propaganda, and there's, there's monetary connection to it. That's not how God works. There's confessionalists where it's a name it and claim it. I'm not sick. Here's what they say. I'm not sick. I'm well fighting off sickness. Well, no, you're sick. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but confessionalists, they don't want to admit that. Then you have uh, the next one is dispensationalists. Uh, they believe that healing was only for the time of Jesus. And since he's gone, it's no longer relevant. You have rationalists. This is the, uh, rationalists is where they just kind of reason things away and rationalize. And then you have realists. What is a realist? A realist is someone who says, I'm sick. I don't know why. I don't understand it. But I'm sick. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe that if it's God's will, I will be healed. I've been called to bedsides of people time and time and time again. And I have prayed for this one and prayed for that one. And that one was healed and that one passed away. Same prayer, same faith, same, same uh, uh, heart was in the right place. But God, God's will was that one was to go home with him and the other one for his to be healed for the glory of God. I don't try to figure out the mind of God. I just, be I just want to be faithful in prayer. So what's the process? The process is if you're sick, you call on elders, the prayer of faith will heal you up and will make you well. 
Last thing, so we pray whenever we are hurting emotionally. We pray when we're hurting physically. Last thing is we pray when I'm hurting spiritually. Pray when I'm hurting spiritually. The fact is in life that there's a spiritual battle that goes on all around us, and some of you today are facing a spiritual battle where you are hurting spiritually, You're hurting inside. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and, and, and confess to one another, and you will be healed. Jesus, Jesus never taught us that you're sick because of sin. Jesus never said that. In fact, that was a New Testament philosophy. That's a New Testament thing that they believe that, that sickness was because mom and dad did something or, or so-and-so did something. But Jesus never said that. Jesus said, in fact, the one story was where a man was, uh, was sick and, and Jesus walked up and the disciple said, hey, is this man sick because of his, his sin or his parents' sin? Why is he sick? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, he's not sick because of sin at all. He's sick because to the glory of God, he's going to be healed. Hmm. I have so many times people will say that. They'll say, well, I don't know why I'm sick. I must be not doing something right, or I must not be living right. And I look them square in the eye and I say, no, we're going to pray and we're going to believe that God will do a miracle. So when I'm hurting emotionally, when I'm hurting physically, when I'm hurting spiritually, New Testament, New Testament church, they confess to one another. The dark ages, they confess to priests. <laughs> Freud will tell you to confess to a counselor. Today's times, they say confess on Facebook. <laughs> but ultimately, we must surrender and confess to God. Mm. So when should I pray? Emotionally, physically, spiritually. So how do we pray? Last thing, how can we pray? Pretty simple. Four things. Here they are. Number one, you ask. You don't demand. You don't. You don't stomp your feet and say, this is what I want. You ask God. And can I just challenge you with something? Ask specifics. Ask specifics about what you're praying for. Ask him specifically what you're looking for. Uh, I don't believe in just doing this shallow cover prayer. I want a prayer in faith because when it comes to pass, I want to say, that was God. <laughs> that was totally God. Only God can do that. I don't demand it from God if it doesn't happen that way. I don't, I don't stomp my feet and get upset, but I ask God to do something in my life. So we're going to ask God. The second thing is you've got to have the right motives. Have the right motives. If you're sitting around and you're praying that get rich, I need wealth in my life, I want wealth in my life, you're sitting around and you're, you're thinking about and praying about getting rich, but you're not honoring God with your tithe, you're not giving him 10%. In fact, you think, I can do better with 100 than God can. But I taught you two weeks ago, God can do more with 90 than you can with 100. So you have to have the right motives because why do you want to get rich? Well, I want to get rich because I want stuff. And God says, I can't honor that because it's not about stuff. It's about my walk with you and your relationships around you. So we ask, we get the right motives, clean life. Number three, we have a clean life. The prayer of a righteous man, the prayer of a righteous woman, the prayer of someone who seeks God, a clean life. And the last one is this, ask in faith. Ask in faith, believing God for a miracle in your life. Believe and do not doubt. Trust God that he will do the miracle in your life. So the conclusion of this series, I talked about a lot of stuff. Some of you really needed to hear how to manage your mouth. I hope you shut up long enough to hear it. Some of you need to learn how to manage your mind. You need to manage your thoughts. Others of you, maybe you needed to hear how to use your resources, how to use your wealth wisely for God. Maybe some of you today, you had learned how to overcome temptation or, or how to navigate difficult relationships. Lots of this was in there. I don't, I don't know where you're all at, but here's what I know today. At the conclusion of this series, I want to challenge you with something. What is it you need from God today? What is it that you need God, you need from God today more than anything else? Some of you, it's going to be a job situation. Some of you, it's going to be a relational thing. Others of you, you're just straight up tired. You're exhausted. You need 
rest from God. Others of you, maybe it's physically yet that maybe there's a sickness that you're facing that no one even knows about. You've kind of kept it close to the chest, but you need a God of miracles to do something incredible in your life. Others of you, it's marriages, it's kid relationships. So others of you, it's financial. You don't know how you're gonna make it through the month. I'm here to tell you that we have a God who does the impossible. The God is miracles, a God who's a healer, no matter where you're at. Right now with your head bowed and eyes closed, if you would, just let me pray real briefly with you today. Father God, you see the struggles of our lives. You know the struggles that we go through. God, and even more importantly, you care about us through them. I know that God, in this, within this room, there are those who are hurting. Those that are hurting emotionally, those that are hurting physically, those that are hurting spiritually. And I pray that Holy Spirit, right here, right now, you'd fill this room with your presence. That you would move through the aisles, up and down, throughout. Look on the hearts and look on the souls. And I pray that God, they would believe that you have the answers they need. For broken hearts, for wounded minds, for sick bodies. You're the God who can do the impossible. You're the healing looking for today. to run. 
We're going to have people down front as we continue to sing this song. And I just felt like, as I was preparing for this week, I just felt like we need to have just a time of prayer. I don't know what you're going through. And, and, and I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Is, is I'm just going to have you just come out. You don't even have to come to these people in front. You just come up and stand if you want. But we just want to pray for you today. As I said, that if there's anyone sick, call on the elders and prayer of faith will raise them up. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're at emotionally, physically, or spiritually. But I know where the answer's at, and it's in Christ. So as we continue to sing this today, I just want to invite you, whether you're going through financial struggles, relational challenges, maybe marital situations, maybe it's family, whatever it is, maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just physically, you need a physical touch today, maybe you're exhausted, you just need rest. Whatever it is today, would you do me a favor, and as we continue to sing this day, we're just going to ask you to step out from where you're at, come down front, and just trust that God can do the miracles. I don't know how. You don't need to know how. That's what faith is. Faith says, I don't get it, but I want to trust the one that can give it. <laughs> and he's the one that can give it today. So as we continue to pray and as we continue to worship today, by faith, step out from where you're at, come down front, and let's believe that God can do the healing today. For nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my
feel like we need to just take a moment here. It's not too late. Something inside of you has been tugging at you for this whole time. And you fought it back and forth because you don't want to be embarrassed. But listen, God brought you here today to hear this word of truth. He can bring you through the darkest of times. You're hurting emotionally. You're hurting physically. He's here for you this morning. Nothing is in- 
nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. God, you hold. You hold us. But we're scared. And we're hurting. don't know what to ask for. God, you hold us. You cover us. God, I pray that you will do that today. Hold us, cover us. As we believe by faith, you can do all things. Thank you, God, for this time being with us. Thank you for speaking in our hearts and lives. And I pray that, God, as we move forward, may we continue to grow every day, becoming more like you, more like your creation that you desire. Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen, Amen.